Good evening. Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Just okay? Well, I'm doing awesome. Um, my name is Derek Distantfield, and I am the co-founder of a company called GSD Venture Studios. And um, I'm based in California, so I, I flew a long ways to be here. But the one thing that I do know is that time is probably one of, if not the most precious resources we have other than money. And so I really do appreciate the fact that you took a couple minutes to speak to me. Um, this is not a let me tell you how cool I am because I'm from Silicon Valley. This is meant to be a talk where I could describe some of the successes and failures that I have seen both personally and friends of mine who I watched do it. So maybe I've seen it, but um, anyways, I want to give you some some things that are actionable um, and things that you can walk away from, from my own experiences. Sorry, my microphone just stepped there. I uh, have lots of experiences to talk to you about, but perhaps not holding a microphone is one of them. But um, anyways, the first thing, the first thing that I want to do is tell you a little bit about myself, some of the things you can see on the slide, and some of the things I will tell you. It's always awkward, I think, talking about yourself. I mean, I can tell you about Gerald, one of the most amazing CEOs I've ever met without stuttering. But when it comes to me, it's always a little bit challenging, I guess. But I have worked in several technology companies in New York and California from zero dollar failures. In fact, I have a half a dozen companies that have never made a dollar. But then I've worked in companies that have had $2 billion exits and pretty much everything in between. Raise your hand if you're an engineer or a developer or do something on the tech side. Okay, you guys are all much smarter than I am. Um, I've always held operational and business and growth roles. So I've been a VP of growth. I've been a founder. I've been a COO. Um, I haven't actually coded ones and zeros. Um, another thing that I've done is I helped build a storytelling marketing firm in Silicon Valley. One of the things when people ask me, do I specialize in B2B or B2C? What is your specialty, Derek? And what I always tell them is, I like products that have a lot of intellectual rigor. I enjoy the process of simplifying it for the user and also simplifying the messaging. And part of the way I realized that mission is I built a marketing firm called Cult Following where we build online and offline ecosystems for medium size and large brands as well. And um, I built that firm using the same process that I build companies today. We would recruit, indoctrinate, and spread. And we worked with companies like Tinder or the international payment company Brex, or even large companies like AOL and Sony and Burger King and people like that. Um, another thing that you can check out online is I helped start an incubator in the United States called Bunker Labs. And it was an incubator accelerator that was specifically designed to help U.S. military veterans get indoctrinated into tech. And I know that there's a lot of fodder and information about America and Silicon Valley, but in the United States, intellectual capacity is evenly spread throughout the country. 
but opportunity is still not. And one of those segments of populations in the U.S. that get ostracized and outcasted wrongly are U.S. military veterans. Uh, in, the, in the United States, it's not common knowledge to believe that people in the military have the skills to be successful in tech. And what we did at Bunker Labs is we provided the tools, the equipment, and the network and helped indoctrinate military veterans into tech. Um, and they have wound up raising $99 million in follow-on capital, and they've gone on to raise an additional $150 million in capital. And so I started GSD Venture Studios. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Here's some of the companies we worked at in the marketing firm. But some of these you've heard of, others you haven't. Trust me, they're all good. Or you can Google them and challenge me later. But um, I started GSD Venture Studios with my co-founder, Gary Fowler, under a few theses. The first is that intellectual capacity is evenly spread throughout the world, but opportunity is not. As I said, I first saw that in the U.S. with military veterans, um, but I think it is more true across the world. The other thing that we believe at GSD Venture Studios is that there is a lot of support around the world around the art of the start. There's pre-seed financing. There's things like Y Combinator in the United States. A lot of government programs. A lot of people seem to be cheerleading around the art of the start. And I think that's necessary. And then on the other side of the pendulum, you have MBAs, you have private equity, you have IPOs, but there is a gap in between the how to start a startup group and you're ready to scale across the country. And so um, what my co-founder Gary Fowler and I also believe is that if you can pop the bubble that exists in Silicon Valley, not because America is better than any one country or the other, but if you can get access to capital from the Valley, that will allow you to define, dominate, and monopolize the space you're in. And that's how you build a company that are not only your children, but your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren will see. And that's what gets us excited. And so we built GSD Venture Studios initially focusing on Eastern European talent. And we did that because Gary, my co-founder, started the first accelerator in Russia. And he also started a unicorn company with a Russian entrepreneur who you guys don't know, but his name's David Yang, um, who started the first tech company in Russia. And so Russia, like Nigeria, has great access to talent, and not just Russia, but from Russia to Poland. Um, and we worked with Eastern European engineers and built companies based in the valley. And we were very successful. Our portfolio has between a $2 million run rate and 100 million in sales. And then what we did was, because it was never about Eastern Europe, we just kind of had that as a niche to start because of Gary's background. We built a chapter model where we set up GSD Venture Studio locations around the world. So in Asia, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, and someday we'd like to have one right here in Nigeria, in India, in Asia, doing two things, working with the best engineers and the best companies from around the world, but also having a flag planted where the venture studio locations can help each other. Because it truly is about using Silicon Valley as a port. So getting access to capital and then connecting with other GSD venture studio locations around the world 
to help those companies truly be global. And so that's what I do. <laughs> uh, the other thing GSD has is a free uh, USA accelerator. This is for earlier stage companies. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, because Spotter um, is a company that is in our accelerator today is based here in Nigeria. Um, Gerald will speak to you guys in a minute, but I think Spotter is an incredible company, not just for Nigeria, but for Africa and the entire world. And what I mean by that is Spotter is an e-commerce marketplace that is on top of Google Maps. But what it also does is it allows for merchants to let people know what currencies they accept. So do they accept Bitcoin? Do they accept Ethereum? The other thing that it does is, I haven't been in Nigeria long, but the traffic's a little rough. And so they've tied into a delivery network where you can get the items delivered to you. And then the last thing is, if you can't afford the items, they have really small loans at a great rate that allow you to pay for those items via a loan. But the global implication, and this is important because I'm not here to sell Spotter, but I, I want you guys to learn, is that this could be used as a platform across the world to help with cryptocurrency adoption, which is incredibly interesting beyond Nigeria, because I know there's, there's some challenges with crypto. But when you start talking about this to other people, there are a lot of people that have a lot of cryptocurrency that want to get those that money into emerging markets, but the challenge is, is you don't know how to spend it. So givecrypto.org, which was started by Coinbase, will donate Bitcoin today, but the challenge they have is it doesn't do you any good if you're in South America or Africa and get cryptocurrency and can't spend it. And that's the problem that Spotter solves. We also work with Premu, which is a on-demanding beauty marketplace. They are not from Nigeria, but they're from South Africa. Again, taking a global perspective, one of the challenge, what they do is it's very much like Uber. Uh, for beauty. So if you need your nails done or you need a facial. But what's interesting is in order to keep prices down for this region, they're getting Western brands to sponsor them, which gives those brands access to Africa, which is something they desperately seek. So just telling you a, a little bit about them and how they're thinking global. Here's a company here, Easy. This is an app that uses AI, including your psychology and your mood, to give you things to do. This is based in the UK, and it's in 45 countries, and next month it will be 35 countries, including Lagos. So I'm telling you about them because just giving you context that we've worked with um, companies that want to come into Africa, it's not only about going global. It's about coming in. Um, here's another one called Liquid Star that does on-demand battery recharging for people's homes. It's already been released in Nigeria. I'm getting waved back into the camera, but what they don't know is how bright this light is. Um, <laughs> but anyways, all right. So enough, enough about me. And if you have questions about anything I've said, you can interrupt me or, or hit me up later. But I do want to make this actionable. And the one thing I want to say is, is talks like this always have a lot of pressure. And I think like sometimes entrepreneurs say, tell me the silver bullet that is going to help my company become successful or validate my idea. Please tell me if I'm on the right track. And the reality is, is you can't do that in one talk, and you certainly can't do that in a single sentence. Um, but what I did was, is I came up with 10 commandments and 10 ideas, and I might not go 10 for 10, but I'm hoping a couple of these will resonate with you. 
And at the end of this talk, I'll give you my contact info, or you can talk to me afterwards if you have specific questions. The, fir the first commandment is the formula for innovation is idea plus execution. The formula for innovation is idea plus execution. And execution is underlined purposely. As I think too often, people get so focused on coming up with the best idea. What is the new next thing? How can I do this differently? But I will tell you that this is where you make your money. I would rather have an average idea with great execution than an amazing idea with just okay execution. I would rather have an amazing idea with great execution. I'd rather have an amazing idea with amazing execution. But I think in reality, um, what people forget is this right here, is how are you actually going to execute it? I can't tell you how many times I've heard, we have something in the, in the US called a entrepreneur. These entrepreneurs that say, I had that idea three years ago. Well, your idea means nothing without the execution. Now, I don't want to imply that the idea doesn't matter. It certainly does. And I think one of the things that people get confused about is they think if they could just do something better, that that is enough. I'm the best in the world at digging ditches. You know, I can do it better than and faster and cheaper than anyone else. That's a great business idea, right? I would say no. I think the experiences of digging ditches has to be 10 times better than the customer. Just being a little bit better is not enough. And that is really, really hard. It's easy for me to say, make your solution 10 times better for the consumer, but we all know it's hard to do. Now, Let's talk about building. A lot of times what I see, and I see this in America, I see this in Asia, I see this all over the world, is people have an awesome idea, they develop a value pro proposition, and they try to get customers. It just doesn't work. Steve Jobs might be the exception, but in reality, what you need to do is focus on a pain. Focus on a problem that people have. If I was going to solve traffic in Nigeria, there are lots of things that you could do to solve traffic. You could publish a blog about the best routes to take. You could invent flying cars. You could create a new way, new kind of traffic light. You could create a bus system. There are many, many things that you could do. The bottom line is, if you create it in a vacuum and just think your idea is good because your best friends agree, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to get out of the office and speak to people and test things and get as much data as you can. The other, th the other thing is, Bill Gates didn't invent the computer. Elon Musk didn't invent the electric car. Jeff, yeah. Jeff Bezos didn't invent online books for sale. Stop worrying about being first. Be the best. So there's two acronyms that we talk a lot about, especially in terms of fundraising. Who's fundraising right now? All right, that's what I like. There's two things you want to do. FOMO, you know what that stands for? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. And what does FOOL stand for? No. No. FOOL stands for fear of looking stupid. 
<laughs> so, and I don't mean you. This is the thing that all VCs fear are these two acronyms. And you need to balance them, balance both of them. And it is an art, not a science. The first one is, is you need to create urgency, which is FOMO, right? You need to say things to the VC, I will give you discounts if you come in first, or I will give you a discount if you close before this date. I don't want to fundraise all year. I need to get this done. Or, hey, because of COVID, this is where the market is now. We need to jump on this. You need to create that urgency. The other thing is, what and, and VCs are scared of missing an idea. One of the, one of the best VCs in the United States is Fred Wilson. And Fred Wilson famously passed on Airbnb. And no one wants to be Fred Wilson passing on Airbnb. But the other thing that you need to balance is if your idea is so futuristic or so vastly different than, than everybody else, you're at risk of making the VC look stupid. And they don't want to look stupid in front of their friends. They want to look cool, right? Um, so you need to balance an idea with urgency with it and being different, but not being so drastically different that the VC has an opportunity to look stupid if he invests in you. Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to go quicker on these other ones. Look, in startups, I don't care if you're in Silicon Valley or Nigeria, you need to act like an ER doctor not a neurosurgeon. ER doctors make decisions with 60% of the information because people are dying in front of them, right? Neurosurgeons are slow and methodical. They take 12 hours for their surgeries and they make every single cut and make sure it's perfect. You're an ER doctor. You don't get to get wait for all the information. You're gonna to be too slow if you do that. I'd rather make 100 decisions in a day and 90 of them be right than make one or two decisions that are always right. You've got to build, measure, learn, and make those decisions quickly like an ER doctor, not a neurosurgeon. One of the things that I think people lie about, who reads TechCrunch? You guys read that out here a little bit? All right, well, let me tell you something. I think what, what happens is people lie. It's not real. And let me tell you how they lie and what they lie about specifically. What people tell you is, if you build, measure, learn, and you get unique customer insights, your company will be good. Who's heard that before? All right, you're like, of course, Derek, build, measure, learn. I read that book like 10 years ago. Uh, I think what people are dishonest about is this idea that Conventional business models are what win, or conventional customer acquisitions are what win. A lot of times the fodder is if my customer acquisition costs are lower, are low enough, then I'll be successful. And all I need to do is hyper focus on Facebook ads and Google, and I'll be a success. And I would say that it's the third thing down here. A unique way to get customers, and I hate to say a cliche, but a hack that nobody else is using. And this is why they lie, because they don't want to lose their hack. But they all have a hack. Famously, Airbnb told everyone about their hack. They went on a website called Craigslist, which is an online marketplace, and they placed ads that way. And they used to be able to place them for free. Um, and they gained a lot of customers that way. But you don't see anything in blogs about, hey, post on Facebook or community websites, because that's that was their hack. And they had an algorithm that did it for them and did it fast. My marketing firm, I sold my marketing firm. There's very few people that I know that have sold a marketing firm, and I'm not bragging. But the reason I sold my marketing firm cult following is because we used an app called Shaper. Has anyone heard of Shaper? It's an international app, S-H-A-P-R. It's kind of like Tinder for entrepreneurs. 
And when I had the marketing firm, Shaper just came out and you could get an unlimited membership for $100. And then you could pick your city like in Tinder. And what we did was, is I hired eight people in the Philippines to do that all day long. And that was 100% of how we got our customers. But no one, write, no one writes about that. And I certainly wouldn't tell you that if I had my marketing firm still. So it's... Finding that unique insight that leads to a hack is how you become successful. This is one thing that is I'm passionate about. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time if you have questions. I think it's easier to say, harder to do, but the CEO's job is not to manage. In the best case, you have co-founders or executives to do that. Your job is to develop the mission, vision, and values of your organization to attract and maintain talent and keep the company alive. That is all a CEO should do. If you're super early, you can do one extra thing, but that's it. You can do sales, you can do coding, you can do one extra thing, but that is all the CEO can do. If you're doing more than this, it probably means you don't have a co-founder. Okay. Speaking of teams, all teams, all companies, and this is controversial, all teams, all companies should have three positions, hackers, hustlers, and hipsters. Raise your hand if you're my hustlers. Come on, business guys, sales guys, the guys that drive the revenue, that's the hustlers. All right, raise my hackers. Where are my engineers at? My engineers are the hackers. All right, who's the hipster in here? Hipsters are your designers. This is the one that gets missed. That's why it's underlined. The design matters. The design matters. The two co-founders of Airbnb are both hipsters. They both went to design school together. They didn't code and they weren't hustlers. The design, the look and feel, the customer interaction, and this applies to B2B and B2C. I've been way out of the picture. Sorry, folks that are live. Look, okay. leading in uncertainty. Is that telling me to hurry? Oh, question. Yeah. So just to, just to clarify, his question was about this right here. Okay. So to be to clarify, this is not what founders should do. Founders should do more than this. The CEO, the chief executive officer, who's holding that role, should focus on setting the mission, vision, and values should focus on recruiting talent, and should focus on keeping the company alive. That means fundraising, begging, borrow, dealing, the other one that rhymes with deal, uh, you should be doing that at all costs. At all costs, you need to keep your company alive. That should be your focus. Now, early on, pre-revenue, you might have one extra duty as the CEO, okay? Because you're doing everything. Now, in a perfect world, you have a couple other co-founders that are your hipsters. Those are your designers. And then you should have your hackers, who's your engineer. So what I'm advocating for is the perfect startup, and there's no such thing as a perfect startup, has three people. You got a hacker who's doing the developing. You got the hustler who's the CEO, usually. And then you have the hipster who's the designer. What I often see is the hipster is just a graphic guy that nobody talks about. And he doesn't have a lot of pull and you, the CEO is micromanaging and say, do this, do that. No, I'm saying that a designer should be intimately involved in your corporation. Does that answer your question a little more? Okay. Um, one last thing is 
Look, times are uncertain. And I, they're uncertain in the United States right now because of COVID and all the craziness we have. And I know I don't want to say that there's even equivalent to that to here. But what I will say is that startups are always going to be uncertain. There's always going to be a thing. And the way to lead in uncertainty, and this is not just from my experience in startups, but from serving in the Army in Iraq and Afghanistan, the way that you lead in uncertainty is by communicating and being effective at communicating. Either get good at speaking to your team or writing to your team, one of the two. And what I would say is you have to leave time for it. And what I mean by that is with Zoom now and this virtual thing, our calendars are like Zoom, 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 Zoom right? But the problem is if you don't leave time to communicate as a leader, then you're just not going to be good at it. And so whatever percentage of your role you believe leadership is, is the percentage of white space you need available on your calendar, or you're not going to be able to do that to part of your job. Okay? So the last thing I wanted to say is that there's been global companies from around the world that have been incredible, and they've done incredible things. And I know that some of you are like, well, that's only two from, from Nigeria, two from Africa, and there's only five total on your slide. Well, here's several more that have been billion-dollar unicorns or more that have started out not from Silicon Valley. And I believe that if you believe in yourself and you communicate effectively and lead, you can be one too. And so what I want to do now um, and I'll, I'll put this back up later, but the one thing I want to do now is tell you guys that I am the co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, but I've been an entrepreneur since I was seven years old. And so I will help any entrepreneur all I can. And so here's three ways you can reach out and connect with me. Um, I'll certainly be around afterwards, but if there's something I can do, I, I will do it. Um, and so what I want to do now is I don't see Gerald. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to set up for our panel really quickly. We're setting up. Hey, Jackie, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and... Um, talk about yourself professionally, but also talk about your interest in Africa as a whole. Sure. Um, so to give you guys a sense of my background, my name is Jackie Churchwell. Um, currently, I'm the director of strategy for WeWork. Um, and in addition to that, I've started my own consulting company called Gratia, where I do a lot of uh, strategy and operations type work uh, for various uh, startups. Oops, now I can see myself. Uh, great. Yeah. And you can see me. Um, uh, I started my career in the banking. Um, I'm one of those people who was lucky enough to do both investment banking and consulting. So I've worked in the city. Um, I went and got my MBA at Columbia University. I worked at Bain & Company after Columbia. Um, and when I was in business school, I actually founded a company called Unbound, which was an e-commerce company. We raised money from, uh, from Founders Fund, uh, from Manzanita Capital, which is the Gap family money. Um, and we actually grew the business from zero to about 300,000 in monthly sales while I was there in about a year. So it was a very wild experience. Um, and I did that while getting my, while getting my MBA. Um, after I was at Bain, uh, decided I had got, I had the pull to go back to the operator side. So I joined WeWork, um, while the, while it was still, a wild scaling uh wild scaling startup with an ipo at some point in the future i was working for one of our vice chairman um who actually um he has an incredible track record he was early amazon 
and early Apple. Um, so he is one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked for, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I was at, uh, so I spent about two years at WeWork, worked on everything from launching new products to how the company was actually managing performance to uh, what the security was for our buildings, um, to new markets, and really um, so, such a wide range of, of projects. And, and that's really what you know what I do in the strategy and operations world is it's anything that um really anything that doesn't fit naturally into someone else's job that's what comes my way um and uh I did that until our IPO failed uh then I helped uh turn around the company which is something I'm still doing um and now I'm working on some of the new product launches for what we call asset light products but it's basically how do we scale the WeWork brand without having to spend a lot more money on um, capital mix. Um And hopefully doing this ahead of our, um, I know we've announced this, but uh, ahead of IPO in the next year or so. Um, so uh, that's kind of the high level of my background. I spend, um, I, I also had a stint in there where I spent some time as an executive recruiter. And so I would echo what Derek said earlier about, um, um, when he was talking about startups and uh, and just getting a lot of different experiences and being really comfortable with the failures, I feel like I've tried so many different jobs in my life and so and really tested every potential um, uh, different. I've been a recruiter. I've been in finance. I've been in marketing. I've I've really done it all at some point. And I hi, I'm so grateful for it. I actually think the generalist is a great thing to be right now. And I think our this skill set's going to become more and more important. So highly, highly recommend that you take a test and learn a bridge to your career. Um, I met Derek because um, when we first met, I was actually in Mozambique uh, visiting a friend and had some, spent some time in Rwanda and Kenya. Um, was hopefully hopefully we'll make it to Lagos at some point. Um, and I just really developed a, a real passion for. Um, really understanding how business technology and career empowerment is developing in other parts of the world. Um, I really believe that it doesn't matter where you come from. It just matters that you get access to the right sorts of tools and opportunities and managers along the way. And so I would really like to build <laughs> as part of the consulting company that I'm building, actually developing more individuals and more great leaders by putting them on interesting projects and and working with regions outside of the us um to create more opportunity um i'm also on a journey to reach every country in the world at some point so i will at some point be reaching every country in africa um but this is more of a life journey so i would say the next 10 years or so um and um really have loved the time that i have there i really think that um, it's going to be the next big market and the world's going to be thinking a lot more about Africa over the next 10, 20 years. And I think it's just such a good investment right now. And um, I, I think, um, like Derek said, execution goes a long way. I think part of execution going a long way is humility and really wanting to show up for the work. And I think that almost everyone that I've met in Africa just has such an incredible work ethic and that's so unique. And if you can team, if you can team that with the right exposure and experiences and mentors, I just really think that um, it's such an incredible opportunity. So. Wow, Cheryl, <laughs> you have a lot to live up to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that introduction, um, Jackie. And just to echo what she said, um, she's an incredible operator that has not been to Lagos, but has been to other parts. So I'm glad that she highlighted that um, because I think her perspective will hopefully be valuable. Um, Gerald already introduced himself. Gerald, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. But just to be clear, Spotter is part of our accelerator company, GSD Labs. Um, and so we're really proud to have them in the accelerator. Um, and it's been great, not just staying in his house, but working with him and helping him 
realize uh, his vision. And so let's hear a little bit about you and, and what that vision is, Gerald. Um, right, thanks for the opportunity, the second time. And hey, Jackie, if you're trying to come to Lagos, so, uh, we can host you at Spotify. Yeah, they have a great uh, uh, duplex. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. doing it. Six story man. <laughs> right, um, so I know I already introduced um, Sporta, so I'll just give you a little bit of uh, a little background about myself. Um, this is not my first play into e commerce, it started way back in 2011 from the US, as a matter of fact. Um, when I was in the US, uh, there weren't so many jobs for um, the citizens, uh, not to talk of those of us who are not citizens. And one of the ways I could find for myself was. Um, to buy used cars and to flip it and make um, extra bucks for myself, and I just continue to imagine. And I just continue to imagine um, what the opportunity would look like if I could replicate or um, duplicate um, the ideas of Craigslist and Co down here in um, Nigeria and Africa. And then I remember when I was living, um, a number of my friends were like, "You're doing so well here. Like, why are you going back to Nigeria? And like, there's opportunity for me to capitalize on in Nigeria." And I started to set up um, shop while I was still in the US. I had a team down here in Nigeria, and um, I came back in 2013. I realized that Jumia, Konga, and um, Judy at the time, um, they were already set up shop. Uh, most of them set up shop like with the years before, two, three years before that time. And they had a lot of funding. I didn't have, I just had a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> Right, and there was no way for me to compete with these guys, so I got to a point. It was a lot of creativity, my forte strategy. Um, but if you don't have the cash to spend, then you can't compete. Um, I tried to muscle my way through the ecosystem at the time, it was easy to meet the tires of Paga and, and, and the rest of them. Uh, but then I realized that it was a different game. If you couldn't get that money, then you are not in it. So I kind of took like a, a few steps back. Uh, to reevaluate and to organize, and that had me um, go go to Kalapa. I tried to partner the um, Cross River State Government, um, who is still on Ayade, and this was a few years after 2013, obviously 2016. Um, and this is this is me trying to get creative to see how I can approach e-commerce game from a different perspective. And it was good. We got in there the first day. We got the signature of the governor. I had his personal signature. It was that good, right? The strategy was watertight. Go out there, get shit done, literally. That's what GSD stands for, by the way, right? And then, um, you know, a few months, few years into that partnership, I realized that. Can we clap that? <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need that guy's name. He must get food. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot. You know, it's like I was telling you guys a couple times already. It's always the hardest thing in the world to tell people about yourself. But GSD, if you go on our website, absolutely stands for Get Shit Done Venture Studios. <laughs> right. Um, you know, but the cross rusty government wasn't as. Um, um, aggressive as well, and at the time I learned what it was or what it felt like to bring in um, uh, cash muscle, right? And we had people coming to the states trying to get stuff done, get shit done, and um, eventually we got frustrated and we pulled out. So I took steps back again. Those, this, are, this is like the story of my failures, right? I took a few steps back once again. I said, wait a minute, how do we really get it done? And um, there was kilometer 51 play, I have a farm, and there's so many things that I've tried to do. But um, for Sporta, it took us two and a half years. Um, that is pre November 2019 um, to actually plan Sporta, like literally plan, organize, and then we started, even in 2019, November, we started with building our community and we started writing our lines of code in February of 2020. Uh, throughout the whole period, right, um, it was a lot of community building because obviously we still had to talk about um, the pandemic was starting, uh, access to capital was obviously going to shrink, access to a lot of things was obviously going to shrink, so we also needed to get very creative to get to this point. And um, I'm sure because of the panel session, I'll get to talk more about, you know, how we did it and how we are going global because that is how we got found by GSD or how we found GSD either way. Um, but, you know, the, the, um, the truth of the matter, like I said, is by playing to e-commerce, didn't start now. It's actually like a journey of many failures, trials and errors. 
And people got frustrated. People got tired of investing me or listening to me. But here I am now being introduced by some of the big guys in the world. Those guys are billion dollar exits. Um, yeah, I'm proud. <laughs> So, the one thing I want to do to put both Gerald and Jackie on the spot is I want the folks to leave with something actionable. So, you know, Jackie, you kind of highlighted it a little bit, and you said you agree with the execution. You work in operations, which is a very execution-heavy role. And you've also took a startup from zero to 300K in monthly income. Where do you start? Like, where do you, when do you leave that analysis stage to executing? And what are some tips that you can give specifically about that leap from, okay, I've talked to experts, I talked to my family, I talked to my friends, I'm going to take the plunge. But what are some like, actual tips that taking the plunge means, um, especially when you have no money raised at that point in time. Interesting. Um, I, I wish I had the, a, a great answer for this because I would say because I'm more operationally focused, I tend to want to just start driving quite quickly. Um, so when we found it unfound, um, we were, even at idea phase, we were prototyping boxes and we were, and we were selling them to people at pop-up events and kind of doing any which way thing to start generating revenue. That probably isn't the best answer. I would say there's more time that um, if I could if I could do it again and what I want to do what I'm focused on doing more going forward is you want to jump in and start doing things but you want to just call that your MVP phase and the thing I would say is get to it fast like uh, that in my experience. Um, you can spend a lot of time talking about ideas and, and you should um, make sure that it's something that really resonates with you. Um, but but once your heart is set on doing it and you know you will regret it if you don't, just start getting out there with an MVP and always know, here's what I need to learn. Here's what I'm willing to put into this and here's what I'm what I want to learn from that. And just that equation always needs to work. Um, and when I say here's what I'm willing to put into it, the way you could think about it is it's X hours of time, Y dollars of money. And I've got three people signed up who all know what they're going to get out of this, too. And in six months, we want to learn if like customers love, uh, you know, getting a certain type of product at this price point and specifically what color the product should be. And if we get to the end of this period and we actually learn that they don't want that product, we don't know what price point they want and we, they don't like our color and we don't know what color they want, we're still going to be happy that we learned. Um, and so I would say jumping in faster and prototyping and MVPing has always been the right, has always been how I've approached things. So I think I know many friends in the startup world will spend six months to a year uh, playing around with ideas and having conversations and doing a lot more analysis before they dive in. And they probably, I would say, they have a little bit of a cleaner, a cleaner dive. Um, I would say I'm I'm an operator, so it's a little messy. I'm always good with that. That's the way we work. Yeah, no, I think that's good advice. And just to, I know she got cut off. When you're thinking what you want to learn, I'll tell you, sometimes it's like, well, there's so many things I don't know, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to test. Really what you want to focus on is those leap of faith assumptions. And there's usually two or three of them. And that are the things that must be true in order for your startup to succeed. So if you're going to sell used cars online, it must be true that people are willing to buy a car online. It must be true that people are interested in buying cars at all. 
So you really think about the things, it's usually things that you know, <laughs> you, you just know they're true. And I would come back to you and say, you really don't. That's not data backed, it's just you know. And so what you wanna do to Jackie's point is start testing and proving that those leap of faith assumptions are true and you're trying to look for the cheapest and fastest way to prove it. And that's what you wanna do. Um, Gerald, you spent some time planning and you had a strategy background, but talk about that leap of faith. You initially didn't have any funding to start. Um, you know, how do you just start? What, what tips do you have that are actionable for people? Right. Um, I, like I said, like uh, Mr. Derek just said, um, I spent a lot of time planning and true to the fact, like what uh, Jackie has said, there needs to be uh, the test of um, the idea. You need to know if this is really viable because it's not just enough for you to have it in your mind. But for me, um, where um, you really, where I really make the jump or make the move is when I put um, something to it, right? So if you call it your um, sweat capital, sweat equity, or sacrifice. For me, I noticed over, over time that when I get to, um, and if I want to start an idea, I look for At the time, I could have tens of thousands of dollars and I just invest in gadgets just so that when I need money, I can live with it. So until I make that sacrifice or um, what do you call it, incorporate my company, then I know that there is no going back. Now, this is because I already tested and I know that this idea, people want it and I'm trying to act on it and no one will take me serious until, you know, they see that there is something um, but let me ask you a question. No, I admit it. Uh, we'll go in a second. Uh, but I just have a, a question is, where does that boldness and resilience come from? I mean, it's. I think it's easy to just not put you on the spot to just say, okay, once I incorporate, I draw the line in the sand, and I'm going. But where do you, do you pull that from? To be very honest, I think it's just uh, bottom belly, guts and grits. Um, you have to just decide. And this is true for me, for those who know me. Um, I have a couple faces that are in the audience that know. Um, it, for me, it really is about the guts and grits. I know that the um, um, odds are really just racing against me. So it's about, and I'll tell you a little story, maybe 30 seconds, right? So Kilometer 51 is a Pan-African um, event. That is supposed to pull in uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm, I will introduce. Uh, uh, this is something I need to introduce to G as a matter of fact, right? <laughs> and I apologize that you just get to. <laughs> yeah, <not me> this. <laughs> right. So, um, so for so the plan for Kilometer Fifty One is we have to literally um, execute road shows and drive between countries on the continent, and because in Africa we know that seeing is believing, right? Um, so I would skip all that. Um, talk about the project and just let you know. So in 2018, after three field attempts, we were supposed to drive all the way to Kodokwa. I drove from Abuja because I only moved to Lagos last year for Scotland. Um, I drove all the way from Abuja to Lagos for us to drive all the way from Lagos to Kodokwa, right? And the night before I was going to depart, we had just, it was three of us, we had just 24,000 naira in my account. And at 11 p.m., I'm still calling my accounts officer, calling the people that I know, um, saying, hey, um, I need a few bucks, like I have to make this trip. And we have ministers in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, and we were all... You tried to loan some money from them or what? <laughs> right, so um, I would say I am kind of like credit worthy for the amounts I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, and yeah, so now you can plan stuff and then things happen, right? In 2020, we didn't know we spent the whole year getting locked down. So you can you can plan stuff and then stuff will still go haywire. Um, so um, the night before 11 p.m., I had 24 grand. I went to the gas station. I filled up my tank. And I told these guys I'm gonna go. And it was a photographer Oba who said, "Gerald, you're crazy." Derek says the same thing. I said, "Yes, I'm crazy." And guess what? We drove all the way to Cordova. We established relationships for the project. 
was supposed to execute one in 2020 again. That was actually the plan. The money eventually came, but imagine if I backed down. Now I wouldn't meet all these persons who are now interested in investing in the project. So for me, it really is bottom belly grit and God. I just wake up, take the risks, and, do, and business is risk anyway, just like Mr. Gary said. Uh, Derek said, if you have a hundred dollars and you want to invest in um, something, well, look for something that is very volatile and something that is more stable. In the end, it is an investment. It can either go down or go up. Now, if it goes up, well, that if it goes down, well, that is sad as an investment. But if it does go up, well, we took the chance. So yeah, great. So one of the things that, that I want to say is GSD Venture Studios travels the world looking for bold, resilient entrepreneurs. And I'm very proud of that. And what I would also say is, and Elon Musk actually said this himself a couple of weeks ago, is that if you're starting a company and you need encouragement, you're probably in the wrong business. Um, and so I do like to dig in on how you become bold and resilient. Um, there's probably a psychologist who has studied it more so than, than I have. But I will tell you that the best startups and the best entrepreneurs that I do is they just keep their company alive. If your company is alive, you have a chance to succeed. And it is so easy to say that, but it is very, very hard to take that leap. Um, Jackie, one of the questions I have is, okay, so you got the company launched and you're doing well. Um, what, how do you decide what is important? I mean, there's only 24 hours in a day. Allegedly, you have to sleep and eat and, you know, take some time for yourself and you have your families. Um, how do you, as a tech company, decide what is important and what is going to help make you successful? Yeah. Um, why is this important? It's down really to two things. I would say, or I, I always think about it in two ways. One is, well, like, what's the thing that's going to drive the KPIs that I'm measuring today? And is that thing on track? Um, that's not usually where I would say I should be spending my time. Like, I should have already operationalized all those things. Um, but I should have an eye towards who's the person running this. Um, and then I really think what's important is, okay, how am I going to ensure I hit that KPI tomorrow or next week? Uh, or, or not next, not tomorrow, actually, next month, next quarter. And so I, I think it's always knowing your health metric and then always knowing the thing you're doing to invest um, – uh, for the future of the business. I completely agree with you. It's about keeping the company alive and, and, and knowing those, those um, priorities that are going to keep the company healthy. But then it's also about looking ahead to saying, okay, how do I not even just keep us alive in the future, but how do we get into a different mindset where we're thriving? I think that's a good point. And Gerald, and I, I mean this sincerely, how do you keep a company alive in, in Legos? Like, tell me, you you know a lot better than I do. Um. So the question, if you add Legos yeah, as in the question, then <laughs> I've only just uh, lived in Lagos for a whole stretch since July last year. Um. However, uh, how I decide what is most important is uh, now. This is about cliche because everybody knows I like to plan. Um, so what I do is I plan in three month bits, and this is as honest as I can get, right? I have it like anyway, <laughs> right? So um, I plan in three month bits, and um, at the at the onset, it's really about survival. Now I'm putting my money in. I'm not trying to stop. I want to um, see the next three months. So um, how will this venture? Or what I'm doing bring us money beyond the next three months, right? And then um, uh, there are other things, just like what Jackie has said. Obviously, you have your KPIs, 
or there are other things that you now begin to prioritize. Now, I've had um, different uh, businesses across different sectors, but I will bet you that um, you're thinking about um, your team, you're thinking about funding, you're thinking about customers and all that stuff. Now, depending on what business or sector you're playing with, then you can prioritize which one makes sense. But for me, it really is the three months week. So when I when I begin my day, just like what Mr. Derek asked, when I start my day, I'm thinking, well, we are in these three months, right? So what I want to do is I start my day very early. I take an hour or two to focus on the next three months because I know that for the most part of the day, especially for the beginning hours, I will be focused on these three months, right? And then I work with it. Um, so I start with the next three months for one or two hours, then get that done, focus on then spend you know, most part of the day working um, these three months. Then I end the day now thinking, okay, there are three, two, three months cycles that I'm planning for now, but what happens if these months fail? So I take like maybe 30 minutes, one hour before, and this is really true. Um, to to um, plan about this one. So it's really like three, my day is divided into three, start for the next three months, spend the whole of the day, um, the one that is present, the cycle that is present, then end it, you know, like a, um, a mechanism in case it fails. No, I think that's good. Yeah. I've actually, I mean, that's amazing. That's, yes. um, so that's how we get shit done. That's how you get shit done. All right, so one last question, and then we could take some from the audience. Um, so, Jackie, what, what could, let's just say, all right, so once you start the company, and then to your point, you start dominating one region of the world, is there anything that you could share about WeWorks? global expansion that you think would be important for the audience? Were there any lessons learned um, in a re relation to expanding a platform across the world that can be applicable that people should be thinking about? Mm, I, we, I would say WeWork has good lessons for what not to do. Um, but I would, uh, you know, I, I think what I would say um, is always understand your motivations for why you're doing something. And I actually would back up and say that about the work you do in general. If you understand your why, um, it doesn't need to be, the thing you're building doesn't have to be about billion dollar business or bust, right? If you can find the thing that you that is going to inspire, invigorate, nourish, help you learn today and connect you with the people that you want in in the work you're doing every single day, your company and you will be successful long term. So um, really understanding your why for your business. And then I would say the same thing for the way you think about expansion. I'm working with a company right now that is, um, they're called better.com. They're based in the US um, and they're looking at expanding to the UK. And, you know, the question you have to ask when you expand is okay, here's how much it's going to cost us uh, to expand. Um, what are we looking to get from this? And why do we think we can no longer get that thing from our current market? Or, why is this an investment we want to make for the future? Because we know at some point we're going to be saturated in our current market. But that why has to be rooted in some sort of analytical answer that says we do need to go somewhere else because you can dominate in one market and be a really successful company without the challenges of going global. And so I would say like, really understand your market, really look at the places here. Don't, and especially, I would also say, don't worry about the US. I think the rest of the world is way more interesting than what's happening in the US right now. I think there's a lot more opportunity. Um, and then the other thing I would say, I know we work learned. You just have to work with people on the ground. Always find the right team in any market you're going into because when you're an outsider, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be more challenging. There's a lot that that comes up that you won't even realize and you think you'll be successfully entering a market. But in WeWork specifically, we ended up buying into leases that were just completely mispriced because we didn't have someone on the ground 
to help us understand how the market works. And when I say someone on the ground, I don't, I think for US companies, it doesn't mean sending, you know, US citizens there to do the deal. It's actually understanding the people there and finding the best talent and developing the talent and being really thoughtful about that because they're going to know all the cultural nuances that can unlock value. Um, yeah, and then what I said earlier, I think, yes, the U.S. is a great market. You can always, if you can make it in the U.S., you can make it anywhere. There's a lot of opportunity and, and wealth and uh, great companies to be developed outside the U.S. Um, and so don't always think that you need to go there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, two quick things. Who's seen the talk start with why? Start with Simon Sinek, right? If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, I think it's an incredible talk. Um, and then I think the second thing, like I always tell people, if you want to enter China, you should have Chinese partners. Um, if you want to enter Japan, you should have Japanese partners. I think you absolutely should find local people on the ground. Um, and I think that applies globally. Gerald, what's uh, a couple actionable tips that you have for these folks, and then we can take some questions and then eat some food. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just put, um, add to what Jackie has said for the last question. Um, so uh, while Sporta may not be um, a global company yet in terms of entering new markets, I would like to say that going global could mean so many things uh, beyond just um, uh, going into a new market and selling to that market. Going global for a lot of companies would be um, selling in one market, and getting investors in another, in another market, or exploring um, global supply chains and stuff. But the one thing that connects uh, um, whatever scenario um, with going global is you have to build relationships. You really have to build mutual relationships, partnerships, and always be willing to offer stuff first to people. And then avoid the urge to always ask, um, first, the first time you meet people. Matter of fact, if you want to ask questions, I tell um, Cedric um, the whole time, and that's the guy in, in the white shirt, and you, you'll see him in a few seconds or minutes. Um, what I always tell him is the right question to ask is not uh, what you want the person to do, but ask the person, what can I do for you? Because that way, um, you're giving yourself a soft landing and you're making the person feel you have their interest at heart. To be very honest, like so, and I have one. I have one tip. I never go to see someone without a bottle of wine, a pack of handkerchief, no matter who they are. Even if the wine is nine hundred naira, when I thought about you, and I'm not as rich as you are, but I try to get stuff for you. Um, it goes a long way. To be very honest, and if you can replicate this, in, and then taught us this in his in one of the sessions, um, avoid the urge to always ask. If you want to ask, ask what can I do for you? If you can do this, I'm sure you'll be on your way to going global. Give first, ask nothing in return, and it will come back to you 10x. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great saying. Well, uh, okay. Who wants to ask a question? Um, I will pass the mic to we'll share. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adeko Daniel, um, the co-founder of uh, the blockchain technology company that invented the first Bitcoin ATM in Nigeria. Oh, awesome. Okay. So um, I want to I, I wanna ask a question. If you have a product, yeah. okay, um, how do you tackle the issue of um, um, prototyping? Because I bet you if um, Sporta goes um, mainstream in Nigeria, it's going to take Sporta only two months for a good program to prototype that product and compete directly with Sporta. So how do you solve that problem? So I just want to make sure I understand the question. The, the question is, maybe you can pass it back. But the question is, how do you counteract people that might copy your idea? Is that OK? So, number one, this is where I go back to one of my commandments, that the definition of innovation equals idea plus execution. So, somebody could copy GSD Venture Studios, they just heard my whole pitch, they knew that I got on a plane, they came here. Um, 
and it would be really easy. My logo, you can copy that. There's a lot of things that we do online. If you go on our YouTube page, we film everything, right? And we're very easy to copy from the idea perspective. But not when it comes to execution. I'd put myself up against anybody. So number one, I would realize that you will get competitors and people will copy you. I would focus less on that, but I would focus on just executing better. And easy, again, easy to say, hard to do. So to be more specific, it's recruiting a better team, um, recruiting better talent, fundraising better than your competitors, um, which again, I know is hard, especially because there's crypto count, uh, challenges here and, and other ones, but um, I would focus less on the concern that people are copying me, but more on I need to execute and grow faster. And other than hiring people, another thing that I think you should keep in mind, um, you should definitely plan and focus on building that lasting enterprise. But the other thing that you have to do, and Amazon does this famously, is you have to relentlessly follow the money. And you have to be relentless at it. Where people are buying and where your customers are and what they're asking for that are they're actually paying for, that's what you need to focus on. Nothing else. Nothing else matters in an early stage other than getting that money from the customer into your hands. And focusing on that and on talent, not on competition is my answer. Um, Derek, I would, just, I would agree with you on that. I actually heard a great quote at one point that says, if no one else is uh, doing what you're doing, it's actually probably a bad idea. Um, I'm sure there are some exceptions to the rule, but you want other people always believe that rising tides will raise all ships, right? There's both Lyft and Uber, and they've both been massively successful. Don't focus on your competitors. Focus on executing excellently in what that means to you, and then have your own value. Right, They're, Lyft and Uber are massively different companies, and they execute in massively different ways. And so, if you're seeing other people in the market, going back to the question around why and the time cynic, like know your why, know your values, know the money that you're following, and recognize that there's always uh, there's always there's generally room. There's very few winner take all situations in in the world. Yeah, the other thing I would say, and I, I said it earlier, is like who invented the electric car? Who invented the computer? Guys, we're, we're not inventors here. Inventors don't make money. And very few exceptions, okay? Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. He made a ton of money. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. But, you know, more often than not, it's not the inventors that make the money. It's the guys that execute the commercialization of the idea better and faster than anybody else. So who else we got? We have another. Okay. Sir. Good morning, it's Anthony. Nice to meet you. Um, um, so I co-founded the company called uh, Go Market sometime in 2019. Uh -huh. Some friends. <coughs> we actually started working on the idea in 2018. Um, but from what we see, and I'll ask you, this is a very practical question for us, yeah. because most of us still have our day jobs. Okay. Um, when we started to start, we decided to start this company, and we've run this company now for about two years, or two years in July. Okay. And um, COVID did us a lot of good uh, last year, because it was grocery, purely buying groceries online, so there was a lot of activities and all of those. And normally the plan is start the business, scale up to it stage where it's able to cater for uh, your livelihood and then you face it full time. But every time it seems like not facing it full time is a problem um, uh, right in front of being able to scale the business. 
So it's almost like a chicken and egg situation. You're not sure if for the, whether the fact that you're not there full time is, is in front is impeding the growth. Um, you also, if you're living in a country like Nigeria where there's no social uh, security net, then you yeah. also, yeah, the decision to make sure that you know what your experience was like uh, seven times, whether you left the job for it, whether you're married, you have children, you have people dependent on you, because all of this government. So, as a matter of fact, last year, because um, uh, where I work, we were laying off a lot of people because of COVID and all of that. And so I put in uh, a letter opting to leave because the package was very really good. And I thought, okay, that would give safety net to focus, but it was rejected. Um, and right now, we're trying to raise money. Um, we've learned a lot in the last year. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've had to find what the idea. Um, um, and part of what we're trying to raise money for is to be able to focus on the business and raise enough money to for at least two years, uh, to pay ourselves for at least two years. And I don't know if that's a problem from your perspective. Um, as an so I'd like to know what you think about that. Look, this is, this is another one of those nobody writes about this in the law. So everybody has this challenge. It, it exists in the U.S., it exists here, it exists all around the world. If you send me an email, a friend of mine, I can't remember on the spot, just wrote a book specifically about this problem. Um, but what I, I would just say a, a few things. Number one is, like Jackie said earlier, you need to have your bottom level. Like, to Gerald's point, you're all in, you're bold, I'm going to go for it. But you need to know if this happens, it's over. Like, this is not, like, be that intelligent gambler where if you're playing poker, if I lose X number of dollars, I'm out. Don't go, you know, mortgage your house or don't, you know, sell your formula to keep your startup alive. There is something that where you have to draw the line in the sand. If we learn this or this happens, it's a failure. And I think you need to have that. The second thing that I would say, and this is where some of the boldness and the grit happens. You know, when I was deployed in Afghanistan, I worked every day for 20 hours for nine straight months. And it was not fun. Um, and it was hard. And I was addicted to energy drinks and I drank so many that I got a headache. Um, but I had responsibility and I had to make sure that, you know, my, my friends were safe. And I'm not saying it's the same equivalent, but I think you can do both. And I would challenge you that you should do both until you're ready to, to take that leap. Um, the other thing, just a fundraising tip. Investors don't invest money for your company to survive. And that's where there's tension between entrepreneurs and investors. Because entrepreneurs need money for their company to survive. Like, like, and so they fundraise. I need money, my company's gonna die. I need to pay my people. I've done so many drug deals to keep them working. Um, and only bought them so much beer to have them work for free, right? And so you go out and raise money. And everybody does that. But the reality is investors only want to put money to pour fuel on a fire that's already been lit. So you can raise money to keep it alive, but you need to focus your story around building a bonfire of success. Does that make sense? So be very careful with, like nobody gives money for you to survive. Like that's the unfortunate thing. They give money because you've done everything you possibly can to grow. You've been successful at growing, but you need to grow to here. And then you get the money. And that's the hard part because in reality, it's not that clean. In reality, it's like, listen, Derek just told me to work 20 hours in a day for nine months, but my business is two years old. And at some point in time, I need to work full time. Like, I'm not in a, a dream world, but so how you craft it is important. I think you can do it. Um, and then you also need to have a stop. So that's my 
three tips. Do you have anything to add, Gerald? Um, I think you said it all. Um, while you want to go into stop with grit and gut, um, you need to know your stop loss, right? Um, uh, when I do stuff, I the one thing, so the detail, the tiny detail from what he said that I'll add is um, I just got back out at the first um, challenge, so that is where the grit and gut come in, but I know where to stop. Um, for me, though, most of my friends know that I never really quit, I just put a pause. Um, what I do is I really just interweave my ideas because it's strategy, so I'm always just thinking. And, um, I'm uh, known for waking up in the night to take stuff down. I always do it. I, once I have an idea, even if I'm dreaming, I know this is an idea. It's not saying anything. Right? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I never really stop, but I know when to like let this go and to re engage at a later time. Just because of time, I'll stop there. Who else has a question? I don't think you can. Yeah, we're good. All right, um, thank you. So, there yeah, are two questions actually. Um, okay. The first is more of a request. And uh, the first is, I suppose we can give us some common, I would like to call it commonly uncommon hacks. You mentioned one with great bits, I mean, that's fantastic. Bitcoin is also a hack, but maybe not for us here, because a lot of us already know about it. But from your perspective, I'm sure you know a few hacks that. Oh, I got an hack for you. <laughs> so, what would it take for us to get some? Please, please. That's the first question. And the question is on Nigeria, and from your military background, have a military background, I'm sure you've heard of exposure of insecurity in Nigeria. And um, I like to think of myself as a problem solver. So, if you think about these things, I think what can we do? And I don't know, not just in Nigeria or Africa, but around the world, I know that uh, there's not there's not much on military tech startups. But I'm looking at Nigeria every day nowadays we are hearing a story of one thing happening to security here. I'm asking what can we do to solve our problem. So from your own experience, if you person and tech entrepreneur. Okay, um, quick one, quick one. There is a there is an overflow room. So just in case they have, we'll just take the next question, maybe one or two from that room. Just one, and then we'll just one, right? Then be right. And I was just also going to suggest that um, some of these things will also be a follow on. Was taking yeah. a hack now, right? So listen, the hacks. When I think of hacks. I think of where people are already gathering, but they're not necessarily advertising platforms. But I find my way, I find a way to get the word out. So one that just came to mind as I'm sitting up here is if I had a consumer app, um, I'd be all over Tinder. I would just sign up for Tinder and I would message people and I would tell them about my app. Um, I told you guys how I use Shaper which was basically kind of like Tinder for entrepreneurs, and we connected that way, and we wound up hiring people um, who would swipe all day long. We had eight people that I paid $4 an hour. Um, connecting with entrepreneurs, I wrote a script for them, and I don't know anyone else that does that to this day. And um, I, I think it's just figuring out where your customer is and how you are going to reach them there. And if you do that, customers don't only go on Facebook and Google. There are other places that they go. Um, and if you were selling to startups or small businesses, could you come here and convince them to put up a banner on this white wall? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things if you first understand where the users are what they like to do, and then attract them that way. It, obviously, security is a global problem. I don't think it's unique to here. I spend a decent amount of time in Russia, and there's challenges there. Same thing, we have a company in Buenos Aires. There's challenges in South America. I think the way that you solve the problem is it requires focus. And you'd have to decide that you relentlessly were going to, to solve it. And I'm not saying you have it, I haven't. Been. Um, but I don't necessarily 
have the answer. But one of the things that I'm a big believer in is that governments don't solve problems alone. And it takes a village, it takes a community. And I think if I was going to approach the security problem, I would try to catalyze multiple players, including government, but also business, education, and the people and bringing them together. Um, but I, I would do it that way, and I would focus locally, meaning that I, I really believe that only the security here can be solved locally. It, it's not going to be, you know, from anywhere else. It has to be like four Lagos, by Lagos, uh, a bunch of everybody working together, but with a passionate leader kind of steering the ship. And that could be a tech company. It could be a politician. It could be somebody that brings everybody together. So, yeah, so we'll take one, um, one last one question and then we'll be. The guys at Overflow, I know you can see me. Um, is there a question from there? I think Cedric was supposed to help. While we're waiting to get a question, Jackie, I don't know if you wanted to add to. No, I, I think that the, it was all great answers. Right. Um, Sounds good. Um, I, I guess we're add, good. All right. right. So I was going to add to what you um, said about um, to what you said about for the hacks. Um, so I'll tell you what. So when we had when we launched our ICU on first of March, I actually sent out personalized messages to um, I think I had about three thousand five hundred contacts. Like I took the time to send message after message and. Direct kind of like school does. I think when we six or seven and said you have to personalize it, like you have to send it to people. Even for this event, I sent out personalized messages until I couldn't because the week has been packed. You can imagine me adding my schedule to his schedule. But it's a great hack for you to actually try to reach people personally, build that intimacy first. These are the guys that will help you introduce you to other people. Um, do you have a question from the other? No questions. All right. So, uh, so everyone, uh, Let's say thank you to Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Can we give her a round of applause? All right, so the one thing that I just want to do is bring this up one more time. Um, I will be around. I can answer your questions. I have business cards. Um, but I, I meant what I said earlier. My first business was when I was seven. I sold baseball cards on the side of the road. Um, and I've been a part of large companies too. So whatever I can do to help, first and foremost, that, that is where, where I come from. Um, and so that could be in 10 minutes from now or 10 years from now. Um, so Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me, and I hope to get to interact and, and speak with each one of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.